Hello and welcome back to ECMath. I'm Mr. Rec and today we're going to talk about uh, higher roots than square roots. I am kind of assuming you've watched my last video on square roots or at least the important parts. Um, so we're going to leap right into it. Uh, we're going to define the nth root of a and say if the nth root of a is equal to b then that is equivalent to b to the n equals a with a couple catches and with similar to what we did with square roots. Um, let's take apart this symbol. So this little guy n is called the index of the root. I-N-D-E-X. It's called the index of the root. That tells you what the exponent of the equation you would be solving is. The index is part of the root symbol. Notice how it's kind of, at least on the computer, it's written right above the little hook. Um, and the whole symbol is called the radical symbol. And the thing underneath the radical symbol is called the radicand. Um, so you're doing the radical of the radicand. Uh, so that's going to help. Uh, now that we know what the index is, there's a couple rules. If the index is even, so I'm doing a fourth root of uh, 2, 312. That's probably not a nice number, but uh, then there's a couple rules. Um, if the index is even, A must be positive, and also the answer, right? So when we say B, we mean the answer, is also going to be defined to be positive. That's just like when I wrote square root of 25 is only equal to positive 5, it's implied that that's a plus there. So whenever you see a fourth root of something like uh, the fourth root of 81 is just 3, because 3 to the fourth is 81, assume that this is just positive 3, which is of course different than if I was solving 3 to the uh, x to the fourth equals 81. That does have two answers, uh, plus or minus 3 but um, the other one's not. So that's a little caution. Just assume it's positive. Um, and you can't do a fourth root or a sixth root or any even root of a negative. That is, you have to have a positive number underneath. On the other hand, if the index is odd, so we're doing like a cube root or a seventh root, you can 100% do the seventh root, the cube root of negative something. You can do the cube root of negative 27. What will you get? Well, it'll be all the solutions to the equation x cubed equals negative 27. There are solutions to that. The solution is negative 3. So a cube root or an nth root of a negative will give you a negative result. And, the ne and because that's true, um, it's legal to take the cube root of a negative it also means there's no need for the principal root rule or plus or minuses because cube roots of positives are positive, cube roots of negatives are negative, and that also applies to all uh, higher odd uh, indexes, indices. Let's do a couple more. Um, by the way, I also want to show you how it's written in the book. The, the little index is like kind of in the hook of the radical, and I wrote that out because sometimes I see students maybe write this uh, sloppily as they're at the 5 out there. And then they maybe look away for a second. Oh my gosh, a squirrel. And they look back and think that this is 5 times the root of 32. It is not. That is very different. This is one of those situations where that 5 is part of the symbol. And it's not just a multiplication or division or an exponent. Um, even though it's sort of related, but it's not the same. So how would you evaluate this? Well, I would be saying, okay, I need some x such that x to the fifth is negative 32. Uh, you can check your powers of 2, but it is going to be negative 2 to the fifth. Gives you negative 32. So this reduces to negative 2. Um, by the way, I know, uh, you know, I knew what uh, number to the fifth is 32, and you may not have. Um, I would really recommend memorizing the first few perfect powers of all the numbers less than 10, right? So know that 2 to the 6th, uh, well, it's 2 to the 5th is 32. 2 to the 6th is then 64. Know that 3 squared is 9. Okay, we knew that one. 3 to the 3rd is 27. And even know that 3 to the 4th is 81. 
Stuff like that is going to be really helpful. Know what 5 to the 4th is. Oh wait, what's 5 to the 3rd? 125, so 5 to the 4th is 5 times that. 625, etc. And obviously, you know, you don't have to memorize every single power of every single thing. But I think if the answer is something less than 1,000, you probably should know it. It's just helpful to. I don't know every single, you know, perfect power less than 1,000, but I kind of wish that I did. So, uh, you know, that's what, what I would recommend for you. All right, so let's do some examples of roots. Uh, fourth root of negative 81. Okay, so I do know that 3 to the fourth is 81. So could this be negative 3? No, it could not. Uh, why not? Well, because negative 3 to the fourth is also equal to 81, not negative 81. So in this case, the fourth root of a negative number is uh, imaginary, or I'm going to write no real solution. Um, so that's something to watch out for, you know, especially now that we're dealing with these higher indices. So, and it's no real solution here because it's a fourth root, which is specifically an even root. All right, next one. That was kind of a trick. Let's do something else. Uh, the sixth root of 164th. Okay, I picked this one because it shows off one of the root properties that is true, which is the uh, property about uh, taking a fraction of a root and splitting that root up is true even with higher powers. So this is the same as the sixth root of 1 over the sixth root of 64. The sixth root of 1 is just 1, and the sixth root of 64 is 2. Why is that 2? Because 2 to the sixth is 64. So that's how that reduces down. Uh, so then this whole thing is just equal to 1 half, 1 over 2. Um, a couple other sort of expansions uh, and clarifications. Remember when we did square roots and we had the square root of x squared? It was replaced with the absolute value of x because of uh, an issue with positive and negative changing signs. That is still true for any even root of an even power. So the nth root of a to the n, if that index is even, should be written as the absolute value of a. If you're doing an odd indexed root of an odd indexed power, um, that absolute value is not needed because positives and negatives sort of preserve their sign. Uh, so the cube root, uh, well, I don't know, it's, it's, the example is everything that's written here. Uh, I will add one thing with the even thing, with the evens is star uh, unless, that absolute value is needed unless there's something in problem that says x is greater than zero, either like a, uh, something like that where, where it's unreduced or it's a statement that says x greater than zero. In that case, the absolute value is not needed, even though it's technically there and just simplified out. Okay, and then another thing uh, that I'm going to borrow from you from the book, uh, the product and quotient rules for nth roots work the same way as the product and quotient rules for all other roots. If you have a product underneath a radical, you can split that radical into two. If you have two radicals of the same index, by the way, it has to be the same index, you can combine them under the same index. And same with fractions. You can split them and you can combine them. With fractions, you have to be sure you're not dividing by zero as well. All right, and just a couple more examples. Um, these are examples that, that have x's in them, so I'm going to be concerned about the, the square root rule. Um, and again, the, the absolute value thing, the square root thing, only applies when you have uh, variables. When you have numbers, you already know if those numbers are positive or negative, so it's not, as in, it's not uh, needed to write anything about the absolute value. All right, so cube root of x to the fifth, what do I do? I want to split that up into the cube root of x cubed times the cube root of x squared. Why would I do that? Well, because I know that the cube root of x cubed simplifies out to x. I know it's not absolute value x because this is an odd index. 
So I have an odd index, I have an odd power. And then I'll write x times the cube root of x squared. And that's probably where I would leave it. Um, this, by the way, this is the type of problem where students do start, that 3 starts to like drift out to the front. And just be really careful with how you write it. Make sure that this is obviously part of the symbol and not part of like a multiplication problem. So something to watch out for. All right, let's do uh, something with numbers. So we're not going to worry about absolute values. There's no numbers here. I have the cube root of 12 times the cube root of 4. I could reduce these out, but I'm going to instead group them up together. Use the product rule. So this is the cube root. Don't forget that index, by the way. People, that's another thing people do is they just say, ah, oh, root. And they forget that that 3 was ever there. Completely changes the whole meaning. So let's put those back. This is going to be the same as the cube root of 12 times 4. Uh, now, 12 times 4 is 48. 48 is not a perfect cube. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually just take that 12 and 4 and write it all out as its complete prime factorization. I'm going to reduce those numbers rather than like multiplying it together. 12 is uh, 2 times 2 times 3, and 4 is 2 times 2. So I've broken out the 12 and the 2 and the 4. Now what I can do is say, wait, the 2s, there's 3 of them, so I can take 3 of those 2s and write them separately. This can be written as the cube root of 2 to the 3rd times the cube root of 3 times 2. So I'll kind of the, the three twos I took out, and then these are the, the three and the two are what's left. Q root of two to the third. I could write that as eight. I don't have to. I know that that's just two. And this is the cube root. Three times two is six. So this should simplify to two cube root of six. And of course, there's a lot of other ways to, to approach that, but I think that's uh, a pretty good one. And I believe this is our last problem here. Uh, so I'm doing some fourth roots. I am going to want to combine these all up into the fourth root of this big thing, uh, 162 x to the fifth over 2x. So that's legal. But before I go any further, I see something in the original that's really important. I have an even root of just an x or an x to the fifth. And what that is going to tell me implicitly is that x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Because if x was less than 0, then this would be completely invalid. It would be a, a non-real answer. Now, we're assuming that we need to have a real answer here. So from here on, I'm going to assume that x is greater than 0, even though it doesn't say it in the problem. Uh, and that's going to affect what we do with absolute values at the very end. OK, let's proceed with the problem. So this is still the fourth root. But now I can, I don't even need to make it a fraction anymore. I'm going to have a fourth root. 162 over 2 is 81, and x to the fifth over x is x to the fourth. OK, so this is then the fourth root of 81 times the fourth root of x to the fourth. Fourth root of 81 is 3. Why? Because 3 to the fourth is 81. And the fourth root of x to the fourth is absolute value of x. Why? Because, uh, well, all the things, we talked about it last video. Um, but this is true based on the rule that we just saw. However, since x is guaranteed to be greater than 0, I'm going to simplify this one more step and say that this reduces to just 3x without the absolute value. Because when x is greater than 0, absolute value of x is just equal to x, so why would you leave it if it is not necessary? Uh, so that's how I would simplify something like this guy. And that's where I'm going to leave it with uh, higher roots, higher index roots. You've seen what, what the pieces of the symbol are. Uh, I think the best thing that you can do to practice your highest higher index roots is really just um, learn some perfect squares and cubes and also practice problems. And so if you do those things, I think you'll be perfectly fine. Thank you all for watching. Leave your comments below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.